Chances are, at some point, a component in the top or deck lid operating mechanism will fail. It is also likely that the device can be repaired. In this presentation, we will look at ways to repair some of the mechanisms that operate the top and deck lid. If you have been through the adjustment procedures and you can't seem to get the top to line up with its locks properly, or the adjustments seem to keep changing on you, chances are the bushings in the control links, control link arms, rear power links, and power link arms are worn. If you can rock the top from side to side when it is halfway up or down, or there is noticeable play in the mechanism with the top fully erect and locked, you should replace the bushings. This is a relatively easy task and rewards are worth the effort. With new bushings in place, it is likely that the top will line up perfectly the first time you go through the adjustment procedures. The bushing kit that we bought came with 18 bushings, instructions, and a tool for installation and removal. The instructions said to raise the roof and place 8-inch blocks at the top of the windshield, both sides, and at the rear corners of the roof. However, the roof is not very stable in this position, and all bushings can be replaced with the roof fully erect and locked. It's a little more difficult, but somewhat safer. Remove the control arm assist springs, then back up all the adjusting screws and disconnect all the linkage on one side of the roof.
by doing one side at a time, you have something to refer to in case you don't remember how things go back together. Using the tool that comes with the kit, drive out the old bushings and drive in the new ones. It's that easy.
until you get to the lower mounting bracket for the roof lift arm. The diameter of the unmachined surface of the tool that came with our kit was too big to allow it to go all the way through the bracket, which is necessary to remove both bushings. Grinding the tool down a bit took care of this problem. With the roof locked in the erect position, removing the rear power link from the car is impossible but we had no problem installing the new bushings once the link was disconnected from its pivots brackets. All the new bushings installed, reassembled the linkage. power link back on the upper pivot bracket is a bit tricky, but it will go back on without damaging the bushing. Do not tighten any of the adjusting brackets or screws at this time. Repeat the removal and installation of the bushings on the other side. Now adjust the roof as described in volume two or in the shop manual. If your troubleshooting led to a bad switch, you could replace it if you can find one, but chances are it can be repaired. There are 15 switches in the control voltage circuitry, not counting the addition switch. Only 14 have names but remember that the roof position C and D switches are each made up of two switches. All of the switches operate basically the same in that they are plunger operated, but they have varying numbers of contacts and some are internally different than others. The roof position B switch, roof erect and delay switch, roof retract limit switch, deck open limit switch, and the deck position B switch are all multi-stage and have roller type contacts. The tray limit switch, Roofy Rec Cycle, is unique in that it has a spring steel leaf for a switching contact. This one may not be repairable if the leaf is damaged. The rest of the switches are basically the same with movable brass contacts. To open the switch, carefully bend the tabs or ears while holding the parts together. The tabs will probably survive when bending, but if they do break off, we can still salvage the switch. With the tabs out of the way, hold the switch so the contact side is up and carefully separate the switch sections. There are little tiny springs inside that you don't want to lose. Remove the movable contacts and then remove the contact springs.
plastic slides. operating plunger is frozen or sticking, soak the assembly in penetrating oil or WD-40 for a while. Then try gently twisting and operating the plunger until it moves freely. If necessary, re-soak the parts. If you want to polish the metal parts of the switch, now would be a good time to do that. A coat of clear lacquer will help keep it looking good for a long time. Once the plunger is operating smoothly, clean up all the pieces and reinstall the plastic slides. Now install the contact springs. Now install the movable contacts. Check to be sure there is spring pressure on the contacts. If there is not, you can stretch the spring slightly until there is approximately equal pressure on both sides. Spray the assembly with silicone and put the switch back together. While holding everything in place, bend the tabs or ears back in place. If one or more of the tabs break off, here is one way to salvage the switch. Drill a small hole diagonally through the cover and the side of the casing. Be careful to get enough angle to miss the contact. Insert a wire bread with a large head through the hole and bend it around. Now, solder the bread in place. excess wire. Check the switch for proper mechanical operation by manually operating the plunger. Once you have the switch assembly back together, check the wire connections to the contacts and resolder any bad connections. Be sure there is good mechanical contact between the wire and the contact itself. If necessary, remove the old broken wire from its connector. Inspect all the wires and tape up any bare spots. Check for continuity between the connector and the switch contacts with an ohmmeter or self-powered test light. Then check across all contacts with the switch operated and unoperated. Check for continuity when the contacts should be closed and shorts when they should be open. Also check all contacts for shorts to the case. There should not be any. Once you have the switch operating properly, cover the exposed contacts with a piece of tape, then reinstall and adjust the switch. motors are basically the same except the roof motor and it's just bigger. The repair process is still the same. 
Remove the nuts and long screws that hold the assembly together. Before you start this assembly, mark the end caps and casing so they can be properly aligned during reassembly. Remove the end cap from the end farthest from the wires, then remove the armature from the housing. Being careful not to overstress the wiring, separate the other end cap from the casing. Note that the brush attached to the field windings will need to come out of its holder. Check the brushes for even wear and sufficient length. Check the brush tension springs for damage. Replace the brushes and or springs if necessary. Most motor repair shops carry a replacement part. Inspect the commutator. Some carbon deposits from the brushes is normal, but there should be no sign of arcing at the edges of the sectors. This would be a sign that the brushes are not staying in contact with the commutator. This could be caused by a brush sticking in its holder, a weak spring, or the commutator is out of round. If the brushes and springs are okay, you should have the commutator turned on a lathe. If the commutator appears blue all the way around, this is an indication of overheating. Check for binds in the motor or the mechanism that it operates. If one or two of the commutator segments appear blue, this is an indication of a short in the armature. Check for shorts between the commutator and the armature with an ohmmeter. All segments should read open. If there is a short, the armature can be rewound, but it is quite expensive and it's probably cheaper to replace the motor. Check the commutator for continuity. You should see a short across all segments. If there is an open, the armature is bad and again, you will probably want to replace the motor. Clean the carbon deposits from the commutator with an eraser, then check for any scoring. If the commutator is severely scored, it should be turned on a lathe. If there is just minor scoring, you can remove it with a piece of emery cloth. Wrap the cloth around the armature in one direction and turn the armature several times in the same direction. then clean the gaps between the segments. A razor knife works well for this. Check for continuity between the end cap and the brush that is attached to it. Then check between the two brush holders. They should not be shorted together. If they are, it may be due to oil and carbon buildup. Try thoroughly cleaning the end cap with alcohol or carburetor cleaner and recheck for shorts after it is thoroughly dry. If there is still a short, the insulation between the brush holder and the end cap is bad. You could replace it but it's probably more trouble than it's worth. Check the wiring from the wiring harness connector to and through the motor. There should be continuity between the two outside connections through the field windings. If there is not, check the wires between the connector and the motor. Repair any brakes or replace the wire if necessary. If the wires are okay, there is an open in one of the field windings and you probably will want to replace the motor. The middle connection should show a short to the end cap. Check the connection at the cap for tightness. 
Slide the end caps onto the ends of the armature and check for excessive play. Replace the bushings if necessary. Apply a little light oil to the ends of the armature shaft and check to be sure all the thrust washers are in place. Hold the end cap with the brush holders near the casing and install the field winding brush into its holder. Now slide the armature through the housing and into the end cap until the brushes contact the thrust washer. Keep a little pressure on the armature and move the brushes to the outside of the thrust washer. Continue keeping some pressure on the armature and move the brushes out past the commutator. The armature shaft should now fully seat in the end cap. Install the other end cap and line up the marks you made earlier. Install the screws, mounting brackets, and nuts. With everything tightened down, check for some end play in the armature. If there is excessive play, remove the end cap that does not have the brushes and add thrust washers as necessary to obtain minimal end play. If there is no end play, chances are you put something together wrong. Once the end play is okay and the armature turns freely, apply 12 volts to the motor from a battery or charger. Connect the negative battery to the center contact of the wiring harness connector. Then touch the positive battery to each of the outside connections. The motor should run in both directions. The deck lift jacks are susceptible to water damage. They have seals at the top of the screw, but moisture still gets into them. When we bought our retractable, it had been sitting out in a field for 10 years or more, and deck lift jacks were locked up tight. The nut parts of the jacks were rusted to the screws. The nuts are located in the bottom of the shafts that lift the deck. Fill the shafts with penetrating oil and allow them to soak for a day or so. Then, with a little gentle tapping at the base and some twisting of the shaft, you should be able to free up the screws. Once you have them freed up, they can be disassembled as described in volume two. The screws can be cleaned up with a wire brush on a bench grinder or drill. The nuts ride on the upper and lower surfaces of the screws, so pitting or roughness on the other surfaces will not affect the operation. The roof lift jacks are not as likely to lock up. If they do, chances are one or both of the bearings in the transmission are bad. However, it is possible the sort of nut that rides on the screw could be corroded. Inside the U-shaped bracket on the nut are several small ball bearings. Take the load off the lift jack by removing the bolt that attaches it to the chassis. Remove the screws that attach the bracket to the nut and carefully pry the bracket out of its mouth. The bracket is in two halves and you need to be careful not to lose any of the bearings. Be sure you have some kind of container underneath to catch the bearings as they come out. The transmissions for the lift jacks, lock screws, and lock nuts are all basically the same. In volume two, we disassembled some of these and saw how to replace the main bearings. Here, we will look at one way to replace a bad worm gear bearing. the transmission disconnector from the lock screw or nut and the driven gear removed, drive the worm gear and its bearing out through the end of the housing. We are using a blunted nail, but if you have a drift that is long enough to reach to the bottom of the hollow worm gear, it will certainly work. What you don't want to do is hammer on the end of the worm gear. Be sure to retrieve the end cap that will come out with the bearing. Now you can remove the old bearing. Some are just pressed on the worm gear shaft and can be easily driven off. This one is from a deck lock screw and since the flexible drive shaft is just slid into the transmission casing, 
the end of the worm gear shaft is peened over to keep the gear from backing out. To remove this bearing, grind the peened edge off just enough so the bearing will come off the shaft. Clean up the worm gear and install a new bearing. If necessary, repeen the end of the shaft. Apply fresh grease to the worm gear and install it in the casing. Be sure it is fully seated in its cavity. Mix up a little epoxy. PC7 works well and its color is similar to the transmission housing. Place the end cap over the bearing, then work the epoxy into the casing around it. The epoxy will need 24 hours to dry. When the epoxy is completely cured, check to be sure that the worm gear turns freely. Pack new grease into the transmission casing and into the worm gear. Reassemble the transmission and the rest of the mechanism. Check for proper operation of the assembly before installing it into the car. The power relay with an open winding should be replaced, but a sticking power relay is relatively easy to repair. To open one up, grind the heads off the rivets that hold the cover plate on. and remove the cover. Remove the gasket, then remove the plunger and spring. Inspect the contact washer. Pitting around the contact surface is caused by arcing between the washer and the contact posts. This is normal if it is all the way around. Each time the relay operates, the washer should rotate slightly. If it does not, the washer will be burnt in one spot and the plunger should be checked for corrosion or damage. Inspect the plunger and inside the housing for corrosion. Clean as necessary. The plunger should turn and move freely in and out of the housing. Do not lubricate the internal parts of the relay. Polish the washer with some emery cloth and then some steel wool. them with emery cloth and steel wool. assembly back together, 
bench test the relay by connecting one side of a battery or charger to the mounting bracket. Then touch the other side to the control post. The relay should operate and release when the voltage is removed. Corroded connectors can cause all sorts of problems. To clean the female connector, roll up a small piece of emery cloth and twist it inside of the connector. Turn it in the opposite direction that you rolled it in. This will keep pressure against the sides of the connector. These connectors can also be cleaned with a small wire brush and some alcohol or carburetor cleaner. These brushes are available at most hobby shops. The male connectors can also be cleaned with emery cloth. This time, turn the cloth in the same direction as it is wrapped to keep it tight against the connector. If the deck lid opens or closes erratically and your troubleshooting led you to the deck lift assist springs, here are a couple of suggestions to increase the spring tension. Fully open the deck to take as much tension off the springs as possible. Then use a pry bar to move the spring out of its notch and down to the bottom of the bracket. This will stretch the spring about a quarter of an inch. If you need more tension, placing the piece of angle iron over the notch will stretch the spring about a half an inch.